All right, guys, if you're not interested in lithium batteries, get coffee and go outside and look at cars. This is going to go bad quick. If you have no interest in lithium batteries, you do not want to be in the room. And uh, this is kind of for adult audiences. Some violence and some sexual innuendo. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome to do all that. I have threatened in each of the last three years to do a session on the theory um, and operation of a lithium ionic battery. Fortunately, I have been rescued by scheduling mishaps and the addition of other speakers and have never heretofore had to attempt it. And I'm going to do it today, which is a little bit compounded by a couple of complications. We have a couple of uh, doctorate level double E's and material science guys in the room and several that if they watch EVTV carefully and repeat the episodes would be able to put two batteries in a flashlight and get it right before the third try. <laughs> Talking to that range of people leaves me a victim because the guys who know will um, not like my use of their nomenclature. And the guys who don't know, won't know really what I'm talking about anyway. So I'm going to be a victim. And the first thing I want to tell you, because you want to know how a lithium ion battery works, is that I don't know. I have no idea. And in fact, I'll let you in on another little thing nobody else does either. As a, a superior subset of the rock ape clan over the last couple of millennia, in a quest to turn dross into gold, we have developed some techniques of mixing potions and lotions and powders together and obtaining results that we can examine, but we don't really know how they work. And in uh, 1996, Akshaya Padi, under the uh, uh, tutelage of John B. Goodenough at the University of Austin, who, by the way, has invented all of the lithium batteries except the first one, lithium cobalt, lithium manganese, and, and lithium iron phosphate, um, smeared some charcoal on one foil and some fertilizer, actually, on the other, and uh, determined that he can get a current out of it repeatedly. From that, we do have hypotheses and theories as to why he got that current. And much is written about that. Um, the awe and wonder with which our body politic views our uh, um, engineers and scientists is a ancient tradition going back to the Ptolemies and the magicians of the court, which despite Moses having exposed as a fraud, everyone still kind of buys into. And they do a lot of this with fancy language, which we're going to undo a little bit today. I have a uh, unique uh, talent, which was actually issued uh, during Vatican II by uh, Pope John, uh, among many thousands of documents that were produced that year, uh, he issued a papal decree of lenience and clemency, granting a seven-year-old boy in southeast Missouri uh, the unique permission to make shit up, and it be pretty close to how it works. Um, there were a couple of restrictions. Um, it was to be for his own personal uh, use and entertainment. Um, and he was specifically not to correct his teachers who were at the time spouting nonsense. Um, but most of those guys are dead now and that document is buried pretty deep. And so today and for one day only, I'm gonna share some of this with you. Uh, please don't report me to the victor of Christ. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how a lithium ion battery cell could work. Um, 
I don't know where to start. Probably dirt. We have two kinds of materials we can divide the world into conductors and um, non-conductors. And the difference appears to be in the latest um, quantum physics that um, certain materials uh, exist in a cloud of free electrons and others do not have electrons to spare to make a cloud. And I'd like you to visualize a crystal structure um, of metal uh, that had a lot of electrons left over. And they are attracted by charge um, and they exist in the material, but they're free electrons and they're not attached to any particular atom. It's kind of like the crystal structure shares all of them um, in a very loose um, alliance. And they act like a gas. A gas, if you put a, a bottle and you put gas in it, um, it expands to fill the bottle exactly and exerts a pressure on the inside walls. If you put more gas in, you increase the pressure. If you put less in, you decrease it. And so there is a uh, cloud of gas in this cable of free electrons, and copper is particularly good, gold being uh, very good, and silver probably the best. And those are conductors. And amazingly, if I add a little more gas to this end, it's felt the length of the cable and near enough instantly. We say at the speed of light, we don't really know. That's all bullshit. It could be at the speed of light. Could be a little faster or a little slower. But instantly, if I put an electron in this end, the increase in pressure, because these electrons want to be apart, their charges repel very strongly. And you may have felt this with like neodymium magnets. Uh, if you get the two identical poles, facing each other, they resist coming together. And as you get them closer, they will resist as a square function. If you cut the distance in half, the force to put them together multiplies by four. And that happens with every successive approximation. Uh, and it becomes irresistible. That's what drives your car in the motor. And that's what happens in the battery and that's what happens in the conductor. So I can put an electron in here, and one will fall out here instantly if both ends are open. I have increased the pressure of those um, charges that reject each other by one electron. And we talk about current flow through the conductor and the cables melting. How fast do you think the electrons travel through the cable? Does anybody have any idea? couple of inches a minute. It depends on the material itself and its temperature. But an electron will travel a couple inches a minute through here. But it's the fact, just like a gas bottle, if I add it here, the entire length of the conductor, the pressure increases, and one would want to come out the other end. And that applies to the conductor, to the current collectors, to the... Um, matrix of the cathode material to the matrix of the graphite material and to another cloud of um, lithium ions in the electrolyte. You'll normally see this described that an ion goes from here to here. No lithium ion has ever gone from here to here in the history of mankind. It would be very unlikely. It's a huge distance of several millionths of an inch. But if I pop a lithium ion here, I increase the pressure of the gas by one lithium ion. And so really, if it could, one over here would transit that SEI barrier into the uh, um, uh, anode. Um, let's see, what have I got here we can talk about? Um, I 
How about lithium? Lithium, I know the green press has convinced you is a uh, rare earth element of inestimable um, value and going to be very short supply very soon. Um, we now know, or we know now, which is the annual correction to what we knew last year, uh, lithium is one of the three genesis elements, which are hydrogen, the most plentiful in the universe, helium, which is number two, and lithium is number three. Everything is made up uh, originally uh, from those three elements. Uh, lithium exists everywhere in the universe. It exists on all continents on planet Earth, and it's 14 parts per billion in seawater, which is four-fifths of our surface, and that's high enough to actually be commercially viable today, and lithium's only about six bucks a pound. So it's neither precious nor hard to find. If you were looking for a lithium brine so intense that it may already be a battery, and you went to Bolivia and walked outside your hotel room, you would be standing in it. But that's not the only place it appears. It's everywhere. Um, this is a representation as we would have in the second grade when I had to make up my own, which was a lot closer than this. But for the purposes of argument, let's say that a nucleus of um, three protons and three neutrons existed with three electrons in these little circles like planets around the sun. Except they're going very fast and they can be spinning right hand or left hand. Uh, and they precess like a gyroscope. And this happens so quickly that it's actually a shell, not an orbit. And, and with the Heisenberg Principle, we already know that we now know that we will never know at what position that electron will be in. Ever, ever, ever. This scale you've looked at so many times that it um, has numbed you. So let's talk about, I'll make up some shit, and it'll be close enough to reality. If I had three neutrons and three protons, and together they were the size of a basketball on this um, table in um, um, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. These two electrons, their um, shared shell, they're in the same shell, a valence band, would probably bisect San Diego and New York City and they would be the size of BBs. The outer one would be further away by twice. It's a terrible waste of space. And everything is mostly space and charges. The, uh, a peculiarity of valence bands is that the innermost valence band wants to have two electrons and it'll do anything to get them both. Um, the next valence band wants four. Now, if it has less than two, it will give them up pretty readily. And if it has more than two, it wants one pretty badly. And the next valence band is eight, and so forth, um, up to about seven valence bands. The outer valence bands are so loosely tied to the uh, atom that the electro potential is extremely small and so the outer valence bands of copper or gold or silver their electrons kind of wander some come in some go out and that's where we get the cloud that causes conductivity and so that's uh lithium it is not rare uh, but it is very light and that uh, outer electron it loses um, almost in the presence of nothing. It just can't keep track of that electron. Um, it's one of our lightest metals, 
it will float on water with about the density of pine. And it's one of our most reactive metals in that if you did float it on water, it would burst into flames immediately, perhaps explosively. Sir, can I ask you to take that box and start it around the room? You may first examine the contents. That is an A123 cell with aluminum foils and copper foils uh, smeared with stuff. And let's talk about the stuff. Uh, as I said, we, um, you will read about lithium batteries um, and they will discuss intently uh, graphite nano patterns and graphene sheets. Here's what they do. Uh, they take coconut shells and they burn them really hot and they put them in a long tube that's eight feet in diameter with a natural gas flame underneath it and rotate it for days and that cooks all the water out of it and we want to do that because lithium and water will burst into flames we can't have any water in our battery at all and they smear that on copper sheets using um, a binder which is a glue the um let me go back to my battery diagram i'm not very good with audio visual as you may note but i did bring you some pictures the cathode material of choice uh, for me anyway is lithium iron phosphate Iron phosphate is a fertilizer. It doesn't cost anything per pound. So we have lithium and iron phosphate. Uh, iron phosphate is kind of tricky in that it has uh, essentially an iron atom with six oxygen atoms that are covalent. In other words, they're sharing electrons directly. And phosphate will share uh, electrons with oxygen with four oxygen atoms. And by doing this, it makes a very complicated uh, polyanion olivine structure. It's a complicated crystal, which has uh, sort of zigzag tunnels through it where the lithium can tunnel into it. But it's a very complex crystalline structure um, and, and bodies, um, um, breakthrough was that he thought a, a polyanion would be good as a cathode material. Aluminum, we know what that is. Conversation came up today, yesterday, oh, why do we use copper on the anode and aluminum on the, uh, um, the cathode? Does anybody know? Huh? It absolutely doesn't matter. We can swap them. We can make them both copper. Ideally, we would make them both silver, but your cars would cost more. It's simply a current collector. This is a, a place where we pass electrons in quantity, in quantity, and they're good conductors. So they pass charges, collect pressure uh, that we put in them, and apply them to our cathode nanomaterials. And they could be hosted on silver foil, copper screen, uh, aluminum um, screen door, um, a chill plate, uh, what, what, whatever. The, the current collector only needs to be a good conductor. And we would want it to be lightweight if we're going to make a lightweight battery. Uh, the magic potion that everyone is uh, in the press is this explosive element that will poison you forever. Um, is again lithium cations positive ions it's a salt the most common of which is lithium fluorohexaphosphate lipf6 and we have to be in a non-aqueous environment because the lithium will react with water and so we use organic solvents and that sounds very magic too ethylene carbonate is uh, the one with the lowest boiling point and the one that smells alike sweet pears. 
and if you're passing the box around, you may notice the odor. If you notice the odor in your car, you've done something bad to your batteries. <laughs> also, uh, very widely held online is that batteries swell in the normal course of things. Swelling of batteries, of course, you can detect that you have overcharged them or over-discharged them or have some manufacturing defect. They are not good. Um, eth ethylene carbonate is a uh, regent that is a combination of ethylene glycol and carbonic acid that is antifreeze and Coca-Cola to anyone by any examination. Dimethyl carbonate is common and used in our cells. We call that DMC. It's methanol and carbonic acid and it is actually considered a green regent. And that means that it is uh, part of a growing analysis uh, where they're trying to identify um, sustainable chemistry. So it's, it's blessed by uh, the environmentalists. Diethyl carbonate is ethanol and carbonic acid. Here in Southeast Missouri, we call that a Jack and Coke. It's whiskey and Coca-Cola. And that is uh, pretty much the solvents. There are some others, and everybody's got magic potion and lotion, but they tend to be in very small amounts. Um, are they flammable? They are. However, uh, the whiskey industry actually has an exemption for the Boca Code requirement for sprinkler systems, and there's a reason. You can pour whiskey out in your hand and light it, and it will not heat up your hand. It has very high escape velocity, very low burning temperature. That's why ethanol is not a very good fuel in your car, but if you do put it in a toasted barrel after about six months, it ages nice. <laughs> Lousy fuel for cars, but it's pretty good at jack powering things. And uh, so that's, uh, it's not really, it is technically flammable. Uh, if I was on fire with it here, you probably wouldn't notice. I wouldn't be warm. Little blue flame licking around the edges. Um, no, not really of any import. Um, under pressure, if you vaporized it and then let it, um, it would be uh, explosive but it would be kind of a flash in the paint. Battery fires are not caused by um, solvents. They're not caused by the electrolyte. I, I, I cannot imagine, it, it's technically possible, but it's so unlike, it, it's not actually technically possible. It would not, never happen. When you read in the press that there was an escape of um, electrolyte and that caused the fire, that's a bullshit detector. That's the only thing I can say about the wider press is that the only thing better than winning the Special Olympics would be not to be retarded in the first place. Mm. Batteries. Um, our batteries in the past have been electrochemical devices where electrons um, cause a, uh, a chemical change in the anode or cathode. And this involves covalency. Um, and that can have a lot of side effects. You, you convert lead to lead oxide or lead sulfate and you convert it back. These batteries don't work anyway close to that. There's no relationship I cannot get the lead out. I will never extract it from the thinking of battery engineers and scientists ever. But they don't have a special dispensation from the Pope. We uh, store charge. We can take an electron off this current collector and we can move it through the wire to this one. Now what we have to do is apply a voltage that is greater than that exhibited between the two terminals 
and of the same polarity. And this causes a terrible confusion. An anode and a cathode in electronics are exactly the reverse of what we're talking about. And the voltage you see when you charge a battery has nothing to do with battery voltage. It's almost completely disconnected. You have to apply some greater voltage to move an electron from the aluminum to the copper or the other way around, which whatever you're using for the collector. When we do that, the pressure, the cloud in the collector increases and the uh, pressure over here decreases and at the point where the voltage, the apparent potential rises to what we're applying, we would measure at those terminals that voltage and it would happen very quickly unless they were very big sheets of copper and aluminum. So we can take electrons off the cathode and pump them over to the anode and store them there. And that's kind of what you do with a capacitor, which can't hold very much energy. Because immediately, the pressure rises in the one and falls in the other. So we have to find a way to make it hold more electrons that we can use later. <clears throat> I want to talk about the anode side first. And the reason I want to do that is because it is a very simple crystalline structure. And I can get a mental image going here what's happening. I can't really do that on this side. We're going to talk about it in the same way. But there's no 3D way to show a um, six-sided, four-sided polyanion. It, it just... It's uh, like a, a Tarsus or a Rubik's Cube or something. You just can't do it in two planes where you could see it. Um, so let's talk about carbon and why it makes a good anode material. Our anode is not actually carbon. All lithium ion batteries have a lithium anode. Our intercalation material, the, the crystalline structure, is carbon. And we don't have a way of mixing uh, lithium with carbon and intercalating it. So what we have to do, we can mix it over here with lithium iron phosphate. And in the formative stage, the first charge, we're going to move them over and intercalate them into our anode. And from there on, we have a battery. <coughs> Let's talk about a carbon crystalline structure. I've got lots of pictures of that. Here's a carbon atom. There. It has uh, four um, um, atoms in that outer valence band, and it will readily share them with other carbon atoms in covalency. Covalency is we're going to share the same electron. Let's say we have the electron go all around both atoms. In reality, we have different ways of doing that. We might have a big figure eight where it goes around one and around the other. We might have a twisted cone uh, where it spirals around the two, um, unlike the other ones. But we can share electrons between carbon and make a mess. I've just lost my uh, my thing. Well, let's go to computer. And my travel drive, and here we are again. Um, let's do graphene, because this is almost uh, hallucinogenic. <laughs> this is an artist rendering of graphene. But what I want you to see is that it's a very simple six-sided um, hexagon that's, of course, continued uh, ad infinitum. 
we can actually do that in layers. Let me see how that would work. Now I uh, messed this up before. There we go. Well, this will work. Here is um, two layers of six-sided octagons, and this in the middle is a um, lithium ion. It is not covalent with any of the carbon atoms. It does not combine with them ever at all. It, in fact, it can't. Um, let me uh, see what that would look like. Here's uh, like a multi-layer version of that turned on its side. This is a little better. Now you start to see one big one and one underneath it. There's a vertical one. There's uh, Brian Seymour. Here's the one I like. They actually stack in... Uh, and we have labels for that, A, B, A, A, B, 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 A. Um, and that's kind of the offset uh, between the hexagons. So we can actually make this plane, but we can tie them through charge uh, and covalency uh, vertically. We can stack them. And that makes a kind of a cage. Again, here is a lithium ion and it's depicted as being centered in that hexagon and equidistant between the two planes. And therein lies the tail. Carbon is a very good conductor. But only along its plane. We cannot jump a charge from one plane to the next through carbon. But along its plane, it's actually an excellent conductor of electrons. And so if we were attached to a copper current collector, we could take those electrons and run them out in that field of carbon along the plane. The lithium ion has a positive charge. It's missing an electron. It cannot share valency with the carbon, but it would be held in position by the charge because of the negative charge on top from the electron and the negative charge on the bottom from the electron um, would tend to hold it in position. That's intercalation. Since we have uh, accepted electrons into the carbon, we call that a reduction oxidation event. And it has nothing to do with oxygen. That's where the term comes from originally, and it caused a lot of confusion with these batteries. But oxidation is when we give up an electron. Uh, reduction oxidation, or redox, is when we accept one. And we're gonna have our carbon accept one, because we're gonna pump it over with our charger. And uh, in fact, I, I'd really rather have two, one in each plane, and my lithium ion is gonna fall into this. Have any of you seen on YouTube the two coils in the ball that is levitating um, by magnetic um, induction. This is the same thing by electrostatic charge instead of magnetic uh, flux. But exactly the same math. Um, the same thing. And so if we could push a lithium ion into between those two sheets, it would fall into one of these uh, positions, kind of like the BB on the little toy where you roll it around and it falls into a little dimple and it locks in there. And that's where it wants to be and it's held there by electrostatic charges above it and below it. Now this is kind of like catching a bear. I can run and run and run and I can run that bear down and I can grab it. Now I've got him. Problem is, he's got me too. 
So the lithium ions, we can say it's held in position by two electrons. We could turn that right around and say the two electrons are held there by that lithium ion. It's kind of a mutual thing among charges. And so we've taken two electrons and stored them in the carbon and they are neutralized charge-wise by their attraction to the single lithium ion. We get a multiplicative effect there. We get two electrons for one lithium ion, except on the next stack, we have another lithium ion. So it doesn't really work out that way, but we can store a lot of electrons in carbon by having lithium ions, cations, intercalated in the crystalline structure of the carbon. Mm. In reality, uh, we're using coconut shell that we burnt really hot and made very fine particles of. And so that plane, you saw one of them vertical and one of them horizontal, picture millions of them going every which direction and they're all broken. When we do add the lithium ion, there is a volumetric expansion of the carbon. And often it breaks into more little splinters of hexagonal carbon matrix. And that's what's smeared all over the copper. You hear a lot of talk about silicon as an anode material. It would be great anode material. Carbon will hold about 370 milliamp hours of charge per gram. Uh, silicon's over 1,400. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is the carbon expands volumetrically and the silicon expands volumetrically four times that much. And it's even more brittle than the carbon so it breaks down faster and you can make a great huge battery out of silicon anodes and it'll last four cycles and you've basically broken the windows you shattered all the silicon and so most of the uh, real uh, I think real um, anode research being done today is how to somehow mix that carbon and that silicon and a polymer or a glue or a something or other to where we can break that silicon and still use it and break that uh, carbon and still use it. Let's uh, see if I can get back to my battery. Here's my battery. I love my battery. The basic parts are your current collectors. This is a separator. The battery is coming around. You'll notice the white piece of plastic. It uh, looks a lot like a trash bag. And that's because it's uh, a trash bag <laughs> with little holes in it. That's to keep there from being any. Uh, remember, we have electrons over here. And we have electrons over here. And if we have any current flow between the two of them, our battery will probably blow up. And so that separator is to prevent any electrical conduction within the battery, but the holes are big enough that lithium ions can go through. And more importantly, again, we really don't pass lithium ions through. They only have activity at the cathode and at the anode. The rest of it is a cloud of LiPF6 in organic solvents. So if I take one out of here, the pressure builds, I need to pop one in here. Formative stage of the battery, we're gonna take our lithium out of our LiFePO4, and we're going to, by moving electrons over there, decrease the charge holding them in, on this, and increase the charge attracting them over here, and this lithium ion's gonna pop out and the pressure in the gas increases, and this one intercalates and finds a hole. There's a problem with our electrolytes. 
which have lithium um, salts. And those organic electrolytes, there are some side reactions that create a, um, a polyvinyl deposit, pun scum. And that builds up on, because it, in, in reacting with lithium ion, it picks up its positive charge, it builds up on the surface of, of the carbon matrix. Mm. This is a mixed blessing. Remember, the carbon breaks down. And this rubber wall kind of glues it all together. If you took a crumbling brick wall and you plastered over it with um, synthetic rubber, it would kind of hold the wall together. And that's what it does. And if we popped a, a lithium ion off and we set, set by pressure caused one to go in here and we popped another one off, we would have kind of a flow of lithium uh, cations and that would increase the incidence of um, these side reactions that cause the SEI layer. But in the formative, first formative charge, we're going to do that very slowly. We're going to charge that battery over three days. And along the way, this SEI layer builds up. And it gets thicker, and it gets more complete. And we have a lot of lithium ions intercalated in the anode. And we still have a few left over here in the cathode. And we have kind of a... Uh, a natural population in the electrolyte. Now, if that electrolyte could ever get access to this huge population over here of lithium ions, if we wouldn't have little side reactions, we'd have a real quick one, and it's very thermal, and it gets really hot really quick. And, and we'll talk more about why that's important later. But we don't want our electrolytes to gain access to all those lithium ions in the anode or in the cathode. And by the way, this SEI layer really occurs on both sides. We don't think about it very much with the cathode and it's not as extensive and, and, and it's a more complicated crystalline structure. It technically does exist and a lot of people don't know that, but, but we tend to focus the SEI layer is uh, called that. It's a solid electrolyte interphase layer. And it's one of the blessings and curses of lithium iron phosphate cells all at the same time. As the battery ages, that gets thicker and it's, uh, it makes it harder for the lithium ions to get through. The coefficient of diffusion increases. Now let's talk about that again. We have all this carbon, this uh, octagonal structure. Let me find that diagram again. Um, ah, here's one. If you'll notice on this one, we have a lithium ion here. And we have one here, but there's not one in between them. And then there's another one over here, but again, there's an empty cell. The positive charges of lithium ions also repel each other, and they really would rather be every other one in this matrix. They will exist on adjacent ones, but only under pressure. Um, so... When we go through the SEI layer, oh, what dimple is it going to fall into? The first one. Now I add more lithium ions. And so all of the readily available slots on the surface of that carbon fill up. But I have more lithium ions and I have more electrons. I'm pumping them out on this sheet with my charger. The charge is building. They're attracting lithium ions. Okay, 
So if I put one in here, this one has to move. Now if he moves here, this guy doesn't like it. He'll move over there. If he moves over there, this one has to find a new home or that is their desire. Mm. So if you go into a nightclub at 5 p.m. and you want a drink, you can walk in the door and you can walk right up to the bar and the bartender's sitting there waiting for you and he'll make your drink and tell you a funny story. And you all chat and you'll tell him how your day went. He'll tell you how it is going. It's all good. Now if you come back at 9 p.m., there's a lot of people in the bar. And when you come in the door, you'll have to wind your way through these groups of people to get to the bar. And the bartender's a little short with you because he's starting to get busy. When the meat market opens at 1130, if you come in the door, somebody's almost got to go out the back door. But everybody in the bar's got to move six inches just to accommodate you. And you may not even make it to the bar. You might get lucky anyway, but it's going to be difficult to get to the bar. This works the same way. The more lithium ions I put in here, when I add another one, the more have to move. And that is diffusion. And so our ability to add charge gets more difficult. And our charge curve turns up. It takes more and more voltage to force a lithium ion into that cathode. And this kind of works in reverse when we discharge. Online and in our community, whenever there's an argument about batteries, the forfeiting party will uh, say the words internal resistance and retreat to that in godlike fashion, which you should not challenge. Internal resistance is a concept. This is not an electrical device at all. It's an electrochemical device. There is no resistance. If you take a battery at a certain voltage and you apply a load, you'll get a current and the voltage will drop. And by Ohm's law, that would imply a resistance from a resistor. It will happen here too, but there is no resistor and there is no resistance. So we call that equivalent series resistance. And so our voltage sag under current would be read as internal resistance and referred to by some as that the proper terms equivalent series resistance and it's used to model battery. They even have a device that will measure it at 1,000 hertz that applies very well to a lead acid battery and it's total nonsense on a lithium iron, ion cell. So if you get one of these and try to read anything, it, it's total nonsense. Our equivalent series resistance is a function of frequency. It's also a function of temperature. It's a function of battery age. It's a function of state of charge. It has so many variables, what kind of a measurement do you have when any wind blowing will change it? You can get what information from that. If you took two measurements and compared them, you would have nonsense because you'd be at a different state of charge, a different temperature, a different voltage, and the battery would be at a different age. Might be one second different age, might be one degree different temperature, you can't compare these two measurements. It is total nonsense. So if you hear the term internal resistance, run, don't walk. Other nonsense. Diffusion coefficient is a measure of the delay and the uh, uh, ability of that battery to make current right now. And you get into kind of a trade-off in your materials. Um, to do that. The discharge works exactly the same way. Let's connect the circuit and doing this charge, there will be a difference in potential between our negative anode. I know that doesn't, that bothers a lot of people, but it is a negative anode and a positive cathode. 
the only power we get is in reference to each other. It is only negative with respect to the cathode. And the cathode is only positive with respect to the anode. And this is why we don't want you to connect either end of your battery to the frame of the car, because then you have a difference potential between the frame and either the anode or the cathode. And if you're touching the frame and one of the terminals of the battery, you will complete the circuit. And um, I don't know, maybe you would explode. I'm, I'm not sure what happens there. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, so th this only makes sense in relationship to itself. But we can connect between these two a load to do work and use that difference in potential and that current flow to represent power and turn a motor or heat something up or run a light bulb or whatever. When we do that, this electron goes back into the wire and it doesn't go over there, but the pressure on the copper decreases and it increases over here. And a little bit of that difference of potential changes. And it makes lithium iron phosphate a little bit more positive. A little bit more negative, actually, which would attract a cation. There's a lot of problems with this. And a lot of what I've told you really isn't true. First place, lithium iron phosphate won't conduct electricity at all. <laughs> uh, it's actually a pretty good insulator. So what we do is uh, intermingle about 5% um, coconut shell again with the um, iron phosphate and the carbon uh, will support uh, conduction. And um, the battery that you're passing around, I don't know where it went, everybody take a good sniff and look at the copper and aluminum, is an A123 cell. And they're famous for having reduced the size of the lithium iron phosphate particle and coating it with carbon and putting a very, very thin layer of this material on the aluminum. And what that does to intercalate in lithium iron phosphate, as I said, it's a much more complicated crystalline structure. You actually have to tunnel in a zigzag path, single file, into this structure. And the next one has to bump you along single file. Um, and there is a volumetric expansion, the whole tunnel can collapse, and often does. And so it's much more difficult, and you have a much greater coefficient of diffusion in the cathode than you do on the anode. So by making this a very thin layer of material, we can reduce that and control that to some degree. And by having more carbon, in that mixture, uh, we can we can help it there too. <clears throat> we get into a trade-off that you cannot win. I said that graphite would store 370 milliamp hours of um, um, power uh, per gram, depending on your carbon. This is 150 to 170. So there's a big mismatch here. And a curious thing, if we did get a graphite um, silicon anode, we have another problem uh, with greater imbalance. <coughs> Excuse me. Rain, could I get a bottle of water? <coughs> This needs to be about twice as thick as this to have a balanced battery. But if we make this thinner, we get a uh, lower uh, coefficient of diffusion and a greater current producing capability. On the other hand, if we decrease this, 
then the ratio of this material, which is the only thing that counts, really in this equation, to aluminum and copper and terminal and plastic case goes down. So if I up my ability to produce current, I decrease my ability to store energy. And so we talk about uh, batteries having a uh, power density and an energy density, and it's a trade-off between them. Um, and you kind of have to pick your poison. Right now, this week, this month, we're seeing a very strange uh, progression uh, a sudden jump in the amount of power produced out of lithium iron phosphate cells. They're normally somewhat less than lithium cobalt oxide or lithium manganese oxide. And right now, all of a sudden, cells are starting to appear with 15C continuous, 20C pulse power outputs. This almost doesn't make sense, but, but they've done it somehow, probably adding some magic sauce of vanadium, yttrium, uh, sulfur, or something uh, into that graphite mix. Um, the separator, as I said, simply prevents conduction. Let's, uh, let's do some damage here. Let's charge our battery below zero degrees Fahrenheit, uh, centigrade or 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And we slow this ability to intercalate lithium uh, ions. And so we're going to perch them in the SEI layer, and we're going to start piling them, piling them up. And that causes lithium plating of metallic lithium, and it forms a dendrite, which starts to grow out of this SEI layer. Now, as it grows, the diameter of the interface between the SEI layer and the dendrite begins to enlarge, and it starts to break down. And now my electrolyte starts to get in there where all those uh, lithium ions are stored, and they start to react thermally. And the uh, SEI layer uh, starts to break down uh, maybe 90 degrees centigrade, um, and as it breaks down, more of my electrolyte can combine with more of my lithium, and we go into thermal runaway. If uh, none of that happened, but the dendrite continued to grow, and we get to this separator, if we pierce that and short to the next cell, I could be at 200 degrees centigrade almost instantly. Why do I like lithium iron phosphate cells? Lithium iron phosphate is extremely inexpensive. It is somewhat lower in both power and energy density than the other chemistries. Iron will give up oxygen pretty readily, but phosphate binds quite tightly to these four oxygen items. Uh, uh, um, atoms. It really does not want to disassociate there. Cobalt and oxide is fairly loosely tied, and if you excite the room uh, thermally to uh, maybe 130 to 150 degrees centigrade, um, lithium cobalt oxide starts to separate from the oxygen and releases free oxygen into our electrolyte where we're having this thermal event. The solvent does not burst into flames. That's, it's not, that's burning whiskey. Don't worry about that. But if we're having a thermal event and we put oxygen on it, um, that's kind of like pouring gasoline on it. And it takes off and our temperature at our cathode rises and it gives off more oxygen and that causes the temperature to go up. And if we increase the temperature, we get more oxygen. And um, by the way, halon fire extinguishers don't really do very much because we're making our own oxygen. 
lithium manganese oxide um, starts to produce free oxygen at a much higher temperature and so it is a safer battery. Um, Kyle saw, you know, I'm making these numbers up, but I can usually get closer to reality making shit up because of a papal decree. But correct me if I'm wrong, manganese oxide 220 to 250 degrees centigrade, somewhere in there. Okay, he buys it, I buy it, you guys don't know. 220, 250 degrees centigrade, it starts to give off free oxygen. Lithium iron phosphate, I'm going to make up another number, but I got Kelso going my way now. He's not going to call bullshit on 350 degrees. None of those are real. I made all those up. But the ratio between them is very real, and now you know the level of what we're talking about, safety in thermal events with lithium iron phosphate, cobalt oxide, and manganese oxide. Those ratios are actually pretty accurate. And, and so that's what we're talking about. So I want you to all go home and tell everybody that Jack said that you cannot cause a fire with lithium iron phosphate. That's not only not what I said, but go look up my battery lab and see all the de burning debris and charcoal that's left from many thermal events I've had. You can burn up your battery. And you can burn down your house, and you can burn down a warehouse, or the state of Georgia. There's a lot of power in these batteries, and once they get going, they're very difficult to put them out. How would you put them out? Anybody know? You know what? Water, which we used to use to put out fires, it's a whole lot better than any of the chemical extinguishers, halon, argon, um, cow's blood foam, any of that. Because we cannot cut off the oxygen to that fire. But if we could cure it, cool it, and guys, 350 degrees is pretty hot centigrade. And 220 is too. If we can hit it with a solid stream of water, we're going to make a lot of steam. Don't be bending over it when you do this. This is best done from a distance. But if you can pump enough water on that and get the temperature back down, you will stop the thermal runaway. And it will quit giving off oxygen. And you could conceivably, we don't know if anybody's ever actually done it, but it, in theory, you could put out a lithium battery fire before it burnt itself completely out. But that's your only hope. Um, I'm gonna take a few questions on theory. We're gonna take a break. I'm not sure I covered everything. Let me think about it while you hit me with some questions. Then we're gonna take a break and talk about cell care and some of the practical aspects that I'm starting to verge into now. Uh, has everybody been able to examine the cell, the aluminum plate? The, uh, there's no mystery here. This is aluminum foil like out of your drawer, but thinner. Uh, it's copper foil. Oh, by the way, the reason they use aluminum and copper is so the dumb Chinese girls don't get them mixed up and put one aluminum next to aluminum. They're, they run on two completely separate lines. They're cut into things and they put them together, copper, aluminum, copper, aluminum. If you go copper, aluminum, copper, aluminum, aluminum, you might not get out of the room alive. Over here. Uh, you're saying that uh, you can swap the aluminum with copper? Yeah, well, absolutely. But if you make it both aluminum, it's gonna be lighter. It would be lighter. But they don't, they don't do that. I've never seen them do that. I've never seen an aluminum and aluminum. The question, well, let's get a mic in here. And again, guys, let's uh, tell me who you are, where you're from, so I can kind of get a mental image of why you're asking this weird, really weird question. Back here. Daniel Johannes. Um, Daniel Anoyes from? Yo Johannes. Johannes. From North Carolina. North Carolina. I love North Carolina. So the copper seems to be pretty expensive. If conductance was the major advantage of it, 
seems to be a pretty expensive element to use there. I was wondering other elements that would work. Um, our best uh, choice there for the um, anode current collector would be silver. And that would also be our best choice for the cathode current collector would be silver. If we can't get silver, our next best choice would be gold. But it's kind of heavy. And after that, we get down into other metals. And um, there's uh, some uh, design considerations that don't have a lot to do with uh, battery theory, but they do have to do with current. Does anybody ever hear about the homes with the aluminum wiring that had heat problems? Uh, aluminum is an excellent conductor. Copper is an excellent conductor. But copper is a lot better conductor than aluminum. And the, these current collectors sticking out the top is a little tab. And you'll see that in the A123 cell, that it's actually a tab. In your batteries, all those tabs are gathered together in a claw that has a hole in it that we put a bolt in it. That's a weak point in the battery. We have to get all our current through that. And, and we want the foils to be as thin as possible because our ratio of foil to active material determines our energy density. And these are simply engineering design trade-offs. One is as good as another, but it moves all the other ones. If we did this out of aluminum and that out of aluminum, then we have to do something else. But the aluminum is lighter and the copper is a better conductor. And why they pick that, it gets into a lot of things uh, to try to optimize the power capability of the battery and the energy density, which are two different things and you can optimize for either. Optimizing for both is very difficult. And so that, that's an a engineering design trade-off. Aluminum's lighter, copper uh, is less thermal under, under load. Another question. Uh, Paul, Paul Dove from uh, Alabama. Uh, maybe I missed it, but were you going to talk about what happens when you overcharge the battery? OK, we can do that. Um, Let's see, what does happen when you overcharge the battery? Um, one of the reasons that um, lithium iron phosphate is safer and more stable and more suited to automotive applications than the others kind of derives from its voltage. It is a lower voltage cell than the other ones. They are typically 3.6 or 3.7 volts. And um, lithium iron phosphate uh, is nominally 3.3, 3.2. That comes from a differential. This is like 3.45 volts electric potential for lithium iron phosphate. And graphite is a negative 0 0.07. And when you algebraically sum those, you get... 3.38 as being the open circuit voltage of a fully charged lithium iron phosphate cell. Similarly, uh, the cobalt oxide and the other ones will be a higher voltage. Voltage can cause a breakdown of our organic solvents and some thermal problems with that, most notably uh, leading to the gasification of the ethyl, ethyl carbonate, the EC, the one that smells like sweet pears. And so if you overcharge your cells, you get two things. The cell swells, the ethylene carbonate starts to escape. Most of the batteries are vented. You'll smell this delicious, sickly, sweet pear smell uh, right before it bursts into flames. Uh, and again, if we can get a thermal runaway going in the solvents, it will start to affect the SEI layer, which melts at a fairly low temperature, 90 C or so, which is kind of the same level as the um, uh, boiling point of um, ethyl carbonate. 
And so overcharging as a function of voltage alone gets us into a thermal event. Note that the higher voltages of lithium cobalt and lithium manganese rarely are the um, electrolytes notably different. They will be a different combination of EC, DMC, and DC, and a couple of others. Uh, but EC tends to be the one. I don't want your battery to go over 60 degrees centigrade and trouble really starts at 70. Um, but anything you do, charging and discharging everything, that's below 60, I'm on board with. You go, girlfriend. But above 70, things go bad, and at 90, they start to go bad quickly, and that's what happens when you overcharge the cell. Again, the myth, swelling of lithium batteries, and this applies to all the chemistries that I know of. Swelling of batteries is normal, negative. Swelling of batteries is in all cases a sign of damage or manufacturing defect. I've never seen one swell without overcharging it, over discharging it, or discovering an internal short. And um, I'm game for anything, it could happen, but there is the papal decree. Who? Uh, Jack Byron Eisenbart from Michigan. Um, my question is, so when we use the recipe to charge these batteries, as you call it, like cooking, making a cake or something, we charge it up to whatever your 3.6 or 3.5 volts is, and then it drops down to an open circuit of 3.38 or so. Um, I'm very familiar with lithium polymer batteries from uh, solar car, basically fairly large scale LiPos. Um, we charge those to 4.2. Mm -hmm. um, and if I, you know, follow their charging recipe, I just turn the charge off after a certain time holding it there. They don't tend to drop very much. Um, I mean, it'll stay at 4.15, 4.2, no problem, and hold there forever. Um, would that be a case of overcharging those cells? I, I have a lot of cycles on them. I don't see any swelling or any odd things, so. Not really. Um, again, that's a little bit different chemistry. Um, but what you're seeing is actually you've disconnected the charger and the surface charge is not diffusing into the material. And what you would notice in, in doing that with those cells, and you will normally not find this with lithium iron phosphate, when they're brand new, sometimes you'll see one stick and, and it will break in and, and start small very quickly. The lithium polymer cells you're using are probably a manganese oxide, and they inherently have a higher voltage, number one, which is why you charge the 4.2. But it's simply a surface charge. If you hook up a load to that and watch it, it's gone in not 60 seconds, it's gone in two seconds. And you'll dive down to about 3.9, and from 3.9 you'll go down to oh, 3.3 or 3.2 or something, fairly linearly, uh, and then it gets quick. That's the surface charge that's not diffusing into your um, layer, and some of the voltage restrictions also, um, your electrolyte's a little different. It's a polymer, and it's a weaker electrolyte, but it's more thermally stable. Um, and beyond that, I, I want you all to understand, I kind of know a lot about lithium iron phosphate cells, and I know a little bit about the other chemistries, and, and this is a sin in batteries you need to be aware of. Lithium ion covers a multitude of sins, and lithium cobalt oxide is not the same as lithium iron phosphate, and many things are very different and I'm not familiar with them. I know a little bit about them, just enough to be dangerous. So when you're talking to somebody that knows about all of them, I don't know where he's been, but it's kind of a specialized thing. Uh, a lithium manganese spinel battery is not a lithium iron phosphate cell, and a lithium iron phosphate cell 
is not a lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide cell. And, and it's like a different discipline. When you start peeling the onion, it starts going in different directions very quickly. That's the little bit I know about your uh, radio controlled cells. Keith Meyer from St. Louis. Uh, I was intrigued with the Solar Impulse aircraft as it flew across the United States mm -hmm. and uh, being able to visit with uh, some of the folks in St. Louis, some of the ground crew, I learned that they uh, were using a battery that appeared to have a greater energy density than you know what the CALB cells have. And uh, I think they may have been using a battery from Dow Cochem. And I was wondering if you were familiar with their cells or have ever tested them. No. I have not, and it doesn't matter. The ones they were using, they've gone to a new one. Um, and they are doing some significant work with that lithium nickel metal uh, manganese cobalt oxide cell, the NMC cell. And I understand they have more magic powder yet, and, and perhaps John Metric will talk about that later. But I'm unfamiliar with their product line. I've looked at it a couple of times, and we've just never used them. Uh, at, to, to a point you bring up, most lithium ionic cells have higher energy and pa pa uh, power density than lithium iron phosphate. Um, University of Tokyo, 2008, they pretty much concluded that lithium iron phosphate cells were the only lithium cell appropriate for electric vehicle use. And I share that um, position. Um, we rate the cells in kind of a vetch diagram of um, expense, power density, energy density, cycle life, and thermal stability. And lithium iron phosphate cells are very thermally stable, are very inexpensive, and have very long cycle life. Those are three very good attributes for electric vehicles, but they are probably the least as far as uh, energy density or power density. Um, and that's where that diagram shakes out. I think there's one other advantage of the lithium iron phosphates, and there's some pretty impressive videos on YouTube that show you know, what happens if you crush it, what happens if you drive a nail through it, uh, damage it, and they're, they're far more safer than a lot of the other chemistries. I've seen some pretty... Um, no, that is the main advantage. It's okay. the thermal stability and safety uh, of the cell. That's the primary advantage. The prim one of the primary advantages for me, however, that I rate much higher than almost anybody using lithium cells for anything is cycle life. And lithium manganese spindle is the worst for cycle life, worse than lithium cobalt. But um, the, the lithium iron phosphate cells, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, 7,000, Jay Whitaker says he thinks a 10 or 11,000 cycles uh, if you narrow that charge discharge window uh, just a little bit. Um, and for me in a car, the whole concept of lead, lead acid batteries in a car that I had a problem with did deal with weight, did deal with range, but most of all, if I quit buying gasoline and put batteries in my car and I need to buy batteries every other year, I've moved my problem from the gas pump to the battery store. If I can get 10 years out of the cells, I move my problem into the capital expense of the car. Now, it's all the same expense, but I like it in the capital expense of the car. And so that's... Uh, so that, that's the, the two strongest points for um, lithium iron phosphate are safety, temperature stability, and, um, and cycle life. And my, and my favorite is the cycle life. That's what's important to me. Um, but I'm not a race car driver. <laughs> and I don't have to have a 500 mile range. I just want the batteries, the 10,000 bucks, to last for 10 years. Any more questions? Okay. okay. Hi, I'm Lee Gasparelli from Sun Prairie, Wisconsin. 
And um, I was wondering, how do we know for sure that the lithium ions don't diffuse through the separator? How do we know that they don't? Because they don't need to. Um, again, we have a gas here. We do have holes. They could, but we have a gas. I pop one out here, the pressure in the whole electrolyte goes up. Okay, so you've got a concentration gradient is what you're saying. It's kind of like the electron here. I can put it in here and move it all the way to the end. It's two inches a minute. And, and that kind of resistance, by the way, that kind of activity is what uh, causes my cable to burn up and it get hot is the actual movement. I get no uh, resistance and no uh, uh, thermal gain if I pop one in here and it causes one to come out here. It's the actual transit of the electrons that, that causes me problems and I have to have bigger cables. But it'll go from this end to this end. And eventually it will get there. But the effect is I put one in and one comes out on the other end. Kind of like a soda straw full of BBs. If I add another one in this end, one pops out the other end. And that works the same way. And, and by the way, guys, it works the same way in a current collector. It, makes, it works the same way in a crystal. It works the same way in the electrolyte. It works the same way all over. You're talking about charge pressures, not the actual flow of things. They do flow, but what really causes the magic is the change in charge. And the charge is felt throughout the wire, the current collector, and right out here to the very end of the crystalline structure, uh, immediately, instantly. Okay. Hi, Jake. Uh, yes, Jack. The uh, so, sometimes people get into this thinking about the ultimate power density, the ultimate capacity density. And who are you, and where are you from? Oh, I'm sorry, I actually know Jeff that. Southern from Atlanta, uh, Kennesaw, Georgia. Kennesaw, Georgia. Yes. Um, and your question, Jeff. Yeah. Well, basically, the question is, how much range are you really talking about from the highest density cells to the lowest density cells? It's actually a fairly small amount, considering the cost, expense, and, and potential danger of the type of cells. Sometimes we overlook how little difference that really could be sometimes. Well, you're designing your thing, and I'm designing mine, part. <laughs> it depends on what your design goal is. It's very attractive to me to have a... 3.8 uh, pound cell that's 50 amp hours at 3.6 volts instead of a um, uh, 4.45 pound cell at 3.2 uh, volts um, uh, for the same 50 amp hours. Now is it, then we get into another problem, is it worth twice the money? Um, and, and so these are just like designing the cell when you're designing your car, you're weighing all that in light of your goals. And I would probably pay that in a speedster light. I'm trying to keep under 1,600 pounds and want to go fast. And I probably wouldn't in a thing that if I go over 50, I'm starting to lose pieces of my running gear. <laughs> so it's, it's, those are, are design choices. And uh, ultimately, it would be nice to have a broad array of cho choices. But you're right, at the, the difference in energy density, but I have to tell you, can be 25% uh, between these chemistries. It is significant. Do you want to trade safety and cycle life for that? And price. Because that's the three things that lithium iron phosphate uh, excel at, safety, cycle life, and expense. Hi, Jack. Wayne Jones from Auckland, New Zealand. Auckland, yes. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the volumetric expansion from the, um, your carbon layer and uh, intercalating. Um, and that would generate your venting activity in the cell. Um, I'm, I'm getting a little lost. Start over. Sorry, so Start over slowly and, and uh, uh, simulate it English. 
Sorry, Jake. We don't insist on. I need to translate to American from uh, yes, from we, New Zealand. Right, we have three or four <laughs> countries all separated by a common language here. <laughs> That's great. The UK, New Zealand, and Australia, and us in Southeast Missouri, it's difficult. <laughs> I can do Portuguese easy, but this is, is a struggle. Okay, sorry, Jack. I'll try and talk a bit. Uh, Just slow down and and uh, and speak up a little bit because I'm hard of hearing and uh, I don't I don't mean to. Uh, I think you've got an interesting question going there. I just wish I knew what it was. Okay, sorry, Jack. I'll uh, try and talk a little bit clearer and slower. Um, you, you spoke about the uh, volumetric expansion uh, in the intercalation layers and the, the transfer of uh, cations. Yes. Um, the volumetric expansion creating the venting activity in the cell? No. Right. So where does the vent come into play? The venting of the cell? Yes. Gasification of electrolytes in all cases. From which process? Would, would that be from the charging process, discharging the heat? It can be either one. Right. If you uh, start to get um, a problem in the cell, and they can be various forms, lithium plating. By the way, over discharging, I didn't cover. But if you get this below a certain potential, the uh, a copper starts to oxidize, like with real oxygen. And it starts to form dendrites that will pierce this SEI layer. And in fact, often we'll open batteries and see, actually visually see from over-discharged cells, carbon with copper uh, painted on it. And that, that copper dendrite uh, can cause a thermal event. The swelling is caused by the thermal, causing usually the EC, which has the lowest boiling point, to gas. But if at some, uh, and, and one study of um, lithium cobalt cells uh, done by Sanyo about particles left as a remainder of manufacture, just a little tiny particle of copper here on the separator uh, can, can reach 200 degrees centigrade locally and immediately and so those solvents uh, will gas during a thermal event they boil and that's what increases the pressure it's not the volumetric expansion it's not the volumetric expansion from temperature of any of these materials these are organic solvents and if they go from liquid to gas that phase change will increase their volume and the pressure in the cell dramatically Right, so the, the main driver for the question was um, uh, the orientation of the cell in, in a um, battery pack being uh, horizontal or lay flat. Uh, is there a potential then to lose um, electro electrolyte? How would I lose the electrolyte? Uh, through the vent. If, if it was, the battery was, uh, for instance, uh, mounted upside down, um, during that, uh, you period. didn't say upside down, right? Upside okay, down so is real bad, right? So lying, uh, say vertical or lay flat, where yeah. the vent is not at the top, it doesn't matter. Upside down, you've closed off the vent. You don't have a vent. Uh, the um, electrolyte, uh, and we just cut that open that battery today. No electrolyte came out. The amount of liquid electrolyte is, believe it or not, mostly held in the separator. And it's a garbage bag, but it actually will absorb electrolyte. If you take a 100 amp hour Sky Energy cell and cut it open and turn it over and dump it out, you get about two and a half tablespoons of electrolyte. But every foil and all of the cathode and all the anode and the separator are entirely wet. And so it's like in a wick. Uh, most of it's held in a wick of your anode materials and that separator. And uh, uh, you won't get two tablespoonfuls of stuff out. But it's still a liquid. And even though it's held in the materials and the separator, if it reaches a certain temperature, it will turn to gas and it expands volumetrically and the battery pressure increases. And that's why you have vent. 
if you put the battery upside down, the two tablespoonfuls block off the vent and you don't have a vent. Now, if you expand, you have a bomb. The vent's to keep from blowing up the battery. So don't do that. Vertical, horizontal, straight up. I can get you any story you want on that. Everybody's got an opinion. Um, I don't personally see how that would, um, would matter, actually. And we've built cars with them laid down flat, laid it vertically on this side, and straight up. I've never hung them upside down. Um, and it hadn't been enough time to know, so I'll answer the question. I don't know if there's a capacity or life cycle impact on laying them down or laying them on edge or putting them upright, but don't hang them upside down. Uh, hey, Jack. Um, I'll try Missouri. And I'm uh, Anu Klup Klupenborg from Amsterdam. Amsterdam? Uh, is that one? <laughs> um, okay, that's about all my Missouri there. Um, I'm going to do a little recap on Saturday. a little southeast Missouri, didn't you? It's kind of like... <laughs> Well, I've been listening for a like while. Greg House, uh, you know, and the uh, uh, Hugh Laurie doing the Greg House uh, thing. That was pretty good. Um, on Saturday, I'm going to give a little recap on what we've encountered with the, um, the Calp cells and what we're now calling a low-level uh, internal short. Um, but for the fact that people might actually ask me what I think is going on and me not having any idea, could you use your papal degree and give our... Uh, uh, um, your best. Could I make something up? Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> All right. I don't know. Uh, if I did, uh, we'd get it stopped in China. Uh, I'm told that it's uh, a short. Uh, if you look in those cells, there's 400 um, pages. It's really a book of copper and, and aluminum pages, and there's 400 of them to get enough surface area to store anything that would be useful. If we shorted two of them, um, that's not much of the battery, but it's not good. Because they're all tied together at the top. Now, if it's a pretty high resistance short, it would be a pretty minimal amount of current. And, um, and you would see what you're seeing and that is a voltage very gradually going down. But I would advise you to get those cells out of circulation because things don't always stay the way they are. And if that accelerated and became a thermal event, it could be a real problem. Uh, what, what we're seeing in a few cells is uh, after you bottom balance them and you walk away, you come back the next day and they're down five one thousandths of a volt. And you come back a couple of days later and you find that they're five one thousandths of a volt further down and it doesn't appear to be stopping. And we have um, some concerns that's kind of interesting. I've had so few cell failures and so many cell fa failures caused by my deliberate act that we've only recently begun to explore uh, how good is that warranty on themselves from China. And uh, I'm pleased to report that although Keegan quavers in his boots, uh, he's put me in touch with the guy that actually has the say-so, and he immediately said, this is a, a slight short in the cells, and we will replace them forthwith. And directed Keegan to um, um, ship to me, to ship to Anna, uh, eight replacement cells. And, um, and the cells, by the way, hold charge and produce power. But they just kind of drift very, very slowly as if they had internal, uh, uh, what is it you call it? Um, um, discharge, which they don't, or they shouldn't. Uh, so maybe we have the first ones where they built in some internal discharge, but he seemed to think it was fault and was willing to send us replacements. Hi, Jack. Uh, I'm Darcy Cazores from uh, Regina, Canada, and uh, I've got a question on kind of cold temperature operations with the batteries as well as cold temperature charging. Uh, we experience easily in the winter, you know, a week of minus 30 or minus 40 C, uh, 
and uh, operating a electric vehicle uh, and sitting for eight or ten hours during the day without any type of uh, heating uh, the batteries or anything like that. What's your experience that you've had or uh, some ideas behind cold we temperature use? We don't get that cold around here, pardon. However, the spec on the cells is you can discharge them down to 20 below zero. The problem is charging them. But that's not ambient temperature, that's cell temperature. If you're out working them all day, trust me, they ain't 20 below inside. And I'm talking about at the anode or cathode. If you've been discharging them, they will be up in a, a pretty temperate range. So my advice is immediately plug them into the charger at the end of the day. Uh, and the charging process will maintain that temperature internal to the cell in the face of very, very cold temperatures. The Jason Horak school of thought, on the other hand, <laughs> would be if you parked it out and allowed it to get cold soaked for a number of hours at ambient temperature, now you're behind the curve. And, and the book on this, I was discussing it with John, good talk, but on reflection, we've never encountered anybody with first-hand knowledge of lithium plating due to charging below zero. And suspiciously, the only chemistry that had that restriction was lithium iron phosphate, and it's showing up in all the other cells now. Now understand that we've got a lot of this knowledge very hard won. The, my first advisory from the Chinese about the care and feeding of some Thunder Sky cells was that your glad acceptance is our warmest happiness. <laughs> and the first spec sheet I saw on them very clearly spelled out charging a lithium iron phosphate cell to 4.2 volts. It was unequivocal. And Winston Chung was quoted as saying that if you charge it to anything less, you would damage the cell. Now, I don't know if he actually said that, but someone quoted him as saying that. Uh, I got a charger from Thunder Sky that was for a 72 volt pack. And I opened it up, went all through it, nothing in it was adjustable. It was hardwired for a voltage and for a specific number of cells, 24. And what they were charging it at was 3.65 volts. That's where the 3.65 volts came from. I made it up from watching their charger and all the Chinese picked up the value from me and put it on the spec sheets. That's why 3.65 volts. And then years later I hear from people when I say 3.55, Oh no, Jack, you're wrong. It's 3.65. We've got it directly from the Chinese. <laughs> now what am I supposed to do with that information? I'm allowed to make up shit. They're not. <laughs> so um, that's, that's essentially the, the but, but it's a very good point. Um, and, and I don't know. I don't know if it's real or not. I have not with my own eyes seen lithium plating. I have read two pretty persuasive papers by what looked like some pretty smart guys that were not making dramatic inconsistencies in the paper sufficient that I became a believer that lithium plating could occur between zero Fahrenheit and 32 Fahrenheit when charging a lithium iron phosphate cell, and I've been passing that information on, but I have not confirmed it. And I've asked John Hardy, and he's not confirmed it. And I've uh, looked around, I can't find anybody to confirm it, but it was a pretty, both of them were pretty good papers. And, and that's, you know, a lot of this just comes from that. People will take off and often investigate one thing, do a paper on it, and include in there something else they found and that's usually more valuable than what they were looking for. And, and we both read a lot of those. Um, it's a little better than DIY electric or endless fear, but not entirely. Um, and so at this point, 
to err on the side of caution, I would not charge the cells at a temperature, a cell temperature of less than uh, freezing, but there are ways to manage that because we're saying the cell temperature, not ambient temperature. And so you can heat the cells, but the cells heat anyway when you're discharging them or when you're charging them. So just don't let it sit outside and cold soak for 24 hours and then hook up a charger to it. But if you've been working it, I mean, you can try this yourself. Take a brass M8 bolt and drill a hole in it and put a temperature probe. And at the end of the day, stick it in there and see what the anode temperature is. It might be 20 below out and it might be 60 degrees in the, in the, the terminal. And that's the only thing that counts. The battery doesn't care about the weather report. It's just the internal temperature of the battery. Uh, and if I was in your position, I would actually do that. I'd have some temperature sensors in um, some of my uh, anode bolts, maybe three or four of them, and actually uh, um, have that available um, and, and not, not charge if it was below uh, freezing. Uh, until further information makes itself available. But a lot of this stuff just kind of migrates person to person, in spec sheet to spec sheet. All of a sudden, this restriction, which was only lithium iron phosphate, is showing up on all the uh, lithium cobalt, all the lithium manganese, all of them are picking it up. So that either means one or two things. They didn't know they had a problem, or they just like our problem or they're just making up shit. And, I, and the, it requires a papal decree to get away with that, guys. You can't just, if the vicar of Christ doesn't bless that, you're in, you could go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> Half those guys are atheists. <laughs> they're not supposed to be doing any of this shit. They have no indulgences. They get, you know, they don't even know the difference between a venial and a mortal sin. We'll work on them later. <laughs> mm-hmm. But he didn't address it. Um, what was he? he was addressing one thing and, and caught my uh, eye with something else. It was the um, uh, cycle life compared to uh, discharge uh, degree that I was uh, keyed on. There was a kid in a university in Sweden who did some unbelievable work, I thought, and a great paper. He tried to do too much, uh, but other than that, it was, uh, it was very good. Um, yeah. There's a reference to that paper on the blog, and, and I, mean, it, I, I mean, some of us can read that sort of thing on the toilet, and others, it's just not good to go there. <laughs> good morning, Jack. Brian McDerris from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, I do have one question. A couple of months ago, you had uh, spoken about using sulfur to encapsulate the uh, uh, silicone, because the silicone could do so much more than the... Uh... Start again. Okay. Uh, a couple of months ago, you had talked about a paper that had come out using sulfur in a battery to encapsulate the um, silicon instead of graphite. I bet I didn't. <laughs> I watched it, and you're the only one I watched. Professor Shui out at Stanford is doing some excellent work but what he did was a, um, um, you know, there may have been some sulfur in there. He took, uh, uh, he coated silicon with, um, uh, no, a polymer, and then coated that with carbon and then dissolved the polymer. And it was silicon inside a carbon capsule. And the sulfur was on the cathode side uh, we call this the egg yolk um, encapsulation, where he did the same thing with, um, I think, a silicon shell with sulfur inside. And right now, they're doing some very interesting work with uh, a polymer matrix with um, uh, silicon and uh, carbon on the anode. So that's a hotbed right now, some of the best work being done in um, um, uh, cathode nanode uh, chemistries. It looks to me like it will yield some of the most promising results 
and some of the least manufacturable uh, things that we may encounter. I don't think we could, I, I think you, they're in a quest for the $100 per amp hour battery <laughs> uh, in some ways. I don't think that that lends itself to uh, manufacture at all. And, uh, okay. Dave Horibnak, uh, Kingsport, Tennessee. Do we have any um, data yet, either through some of your testing or other testing or EVs with, you know, 100,000 miles, kind of showing that the, the batteries can go those 6,000, 7,000 cycles? Or are we still too early in and it, you know, it's looking hopeful, but we don't have the hard data yet. I, I don't know how to respond to that, Dave. Um, uh, yes, we've had data all along. Um, do, will we have data that will be persuasive to you? Uh, I'm gonna guess not. It is perfectly legitimate to take a battery cell, one of them even, but certainly a selection of them, and do a full charge and discharge to 100% 500 times and determine that your capacity at the end of that is 94% and extrapolate that to uh, 2,000 cycles for that cell to 80%. And it's even further um, completely uh, valid uh, to say that you get 2,000 cycles at 80% even though you tested it to 100 and I'm very comfortable with all of that. Now you want me to go drive around circles for 300,000 miles to prove it, that, that will come, but not for me. I'm not gonna go get in the car and do that. I'm okay with the cycle testing. It's completely valid testing. And there is a group of people online who will tell you that that's all laboratory and it's uh, uh, not right and not, it's like they're crows on a fence, they never shut up and they have no idea what they're talking about. Um, it's completely valid to extrapolate that kind of a trend line from data that is significant in, in quantity and number. Um, if you take 500 cells and do 500 cycles, I wanna talk about 10,000 cycles, it's perfectly permissible. Um, the decrease in uh, depth of discharge impact on uh, capacity, that may be what you're referring to, and that was the gun paper that I liked, and, and we don't know. The Chinese made up the 80%, and, and they don't even have a pope. <laughs> but the tests were done to 100% discharge. It implied 2,000 cycles at 100%. <clears throat> and so they are somewhat conservative and said 80% with no data uh, to imply that. And then they further said uh, 3,000 cycles to 70%, indicating their belief that depth of discharge does matter, but they've never shown me any data of that, which is why I like the gun paper. It did tend to confirm it. My personal sense is if you took a Calb CA series cell and charged it to 51% and discharged it to 49%, you could repeat that act for the next 80 years and you would die and it would still be going. <coughs> uh, and I guess that brings up a practical matter and that is fully charging your car is not only not very important, but it's, it's becoming common knowledge at General Motors and at Toyota and at Nissan and at Tesla that um, being closer to the middle, uh, certainly for storage, uh, is good medicine. And how good that is, I don't know. But everybody's pretty much accepting that. Hey, Jack. Uh, Nabil, thank you. Moore in Iowa. I just uh -huh. wanted to interject regarding the uh, question of uh, cold weather operation. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a year and a half long uh, test going that uh, I have analysis forthcoming. 
uh, put uh, four cells into the starter battery configuration on my Toyota Corolla rush bucket. Mm -hmm. Operated it at cold weather, did nothing to protect the cells, just let the alternator do what it's doing. So I've been overcharging them and I've been operating it at well below freezing uh, regularly. And uh, when I did that, I bought five cells, have the fifth one uh, sitting to the side, never been touched. So um, I will be doing some capacity tests to uh, see what I get. That, to me, that would render nonsense. But uh, it, it might be an interesting result. Uh, an SLI battery, the first thing you're gonna do is take a huge amount of current out of it, heat the cell up thoroughly, and then charge it very gently um, the whole time you're operating the car. When did it go below zero degrees? Yeah. Uh, through no, no, that's the ambient air temperature. Right. I don't have the, the first thing you're going to do is take a thousand amps out of it and, and start your car. Now we're already above uh, uh, tropical inside the cell. Now you're going to put a charger on it. What does that prove? At what point are you going to charge it first? It's an SLI battery. You're always going to start the car first. Right. You're never going to put a charger on it below him uh, uh, freezing. It's not. I, I can't imagine this scenario. You haven't. You haven't done it once, and you couldn't do it a, a, the first time. It's less the second because um, you always have to start the car first. Uh, that and that was my advice: is to put a measurement on the uh, anode um, for curiosity. But as a practical matter, if you're working the device all day and you put it on the charger immediately, you're fine. I would do it blindly. I wouldn't even bother. Um, but don't let it sit out and get cold soaked and then put it on the charger. It's okay to put it out and get it cold soaked and start the car and drive away. That's fine. Uh, Jason only drove two blocks and put it in his garage, then turned on the heater to try to get the temperature up. My advice would be go drive around the block a few times instead of the two blocks. But he had a theory that if he turned on the heater and went and watched um, Jeopardy, that uh, when he got back, all would be good. And he woke up the next morning and it wasn't good. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we blew through my cell care session. On the theory side, I'm really bad at this uh, presentation thing. That's why our videos are two and a half hours long. It's lunchtime. It is served. Please enjoy.